Welcome to this lesson about water cycle and discharge measurement. We all know such a typical representation of the water cycle. If we are interested mostly in quantifying the water fluxes, this cycle can be represented as follows, where the blue arrows represent the natural fluxes. Precipitation induces runoff, here, and this water finally arrives in rivers and then in oceans. Another part of the precipitation infiltrates in the ground, and a third part is intercepted by vegetation. Underground flow, fed by infiltration, either flow towards rivers or is absorbed by vegetation. The vegetation releases water by evapotranspiration, while rivers and oceans lose part of their waters by evaporation. The water reaching the clouds by evaporation and evapotranspiration then produces new precipitation. The balance is summarized by this equation, where P is the total precipitation, I the interception by vegetation, E the evaporation, F plus S the storage in depressions and by infiltration, and P net is the net rain, that is the quantity of rainwater that will produce direct runoff and thus a direct discharge. We can add the human consumption and their interaction with the natural fluxes to the diagram. Consumption represents all human activities that need water or release water to the ecosystem. Water is collected from rivers, underground flows and oceans and is then released as wastewater, irrigation water or evaporation from cooling towers, for example. Evaporation constitutes a significant loss of water. It represents, on average, 910 mm per year. That is to be compared to the average annual precipitation in Belgium, about 850 mm. Of course, this doesn't mean that there remains no net rain in countries with less than 910 mm of rain. Here, we compare the average values, but in the reality, the balance uh, the balance between precipitation and evaporation is made simultaneously during a rain event. We can also see that oceans here contribute to more than 80% to, uh, to the total evaporation. Different factors listed here affect the potential evaporation of a region. Hygrometry represents the air moisture, so if the air is humid, already saturated with water, the potential for evaporation is low. The temperature also plays a role, as we have seen that warm air can contain more water vapor than cold air. Air renewal is another factor affecting the potential evaporation, as winds can activate the evaporation pr uh, process. This latter process is in fact the most efficient one for evaporation. And finally, the type of soil or the soil coverage is a key factor. We can see here that if we take as a reference the potential evaporation for free water, like in lakes or dam reservoirs, it is less for other soil coverages. For example, if the water is covered by a forest, this reduces significantly the evaporation potential. But then, uncovered soil again has a very high evaporation potential that decreases again with vegetation and forest coverage. Evaporation can be measured, for example, using the pitch evaporimeter, that is a curved tube filled with water and covered with blotting paper. So the water that evaporates from the paper is lost and the amount of water in the tube decreases. Consequently, the level in the tube provides a measurement of the potential evaporation. Evaporation can also be measured using this very simple device, just an open, wide pan filled with water. This device provides the best estimate of evaporation in a lake or a dam reservoir. Some common formulas are proposed here to determine the potential evapotranspiration for each month of the year as a function of the mean temperature Tm 
of the considered month and of the latitude lambda of the location. So an example of the latitude correction factor is given here for a latitude of 25 degrees north, which is in fact the approximate latitude of Haiti that served in many of our examples. The average evaporation of a catchment can be evaluated using the concept of flow deficit. Indeed, the water balance over a catchment can be written like this here. S is the underground storage. P represents the mean precipitation. Q is the mean discharge at the outlet of the catchment. E, the average evaporation. And delta S, the difference of storage. If we consider a sufficiently long period, delta S can be neglected and the total storage is almost constant from one year to another. So the equation simplifies. From there, we can exp express D, the flow deficit, that represents the losses due mainly to evaporation, and thus an approximation of this evaporation. Coutagne and Turk have proposed formulas to estimate the evaporation losses in which Tm is the mean temperature. The graph illustrates the deficit calculated with Turk's formula for different average temperatures and precipitation. Let us apply all this to an example. Um, here, the Rüppel catchment that is located in the north of Belgium. The catchment is 3,815 square kilometers. It has an average temperature of 9.75 degrees and an average annual rainfall of 831.4 millimeter. We can calculate the flow deficit according to the formulations of Turk here, uh, uh, Turk here and Coutagne, and we see that the two values are close to each other. From there, we can estimate the quantity of water that is available for runoff and transform it into an equivalent mean discharge. We see here that on average, we can count on 38 cubic meter per second at the outlet of the catchment. Of course, this is an annual mean value that does not take into account any seasonal variability. This estimation of a discharge leads us to discharge measurements. How are these achieved? We will see that there are basically two types of methods. Direct measurements of variables that are directly related to the discharge and indirect measurements of auxiliary quantities that can be linked to the discharge through a physical relation. As indicated in the equation here, the discharge is by definition the integration of the velocity over the cross-section. So, to measure the discharge, we need to measure the cross-section and the velocity. This can be achieved using different instruments that provide point velocity measurements or measurements over a vertical or a horizontal line. Then, these discrete measurements are integrated over the cross-section to obtain the discharge. The first possible instrument to measure the velocity at different points in the cross-section is the mini-propeller current meter. The rotation speed of the propeller can be directly related to the flow velocity. This point measurement can be achieved from a fixed observation point, for example by standing in the river for small rivers, or from a bridge. It is also possible to perform point measurements from a boat traveling along the cross-section. This will mainly depend finally on the size of the river. Other instruments allow for measurements along a line, such as ADCP, that works on the basis of the Doppler effect between an emitter and a receiver. Such a profiler can be placed horizontally in the river to measure the transversal velocity profile at a given depth. In this case, the selection of the depth should be done carefully. If the gauge is placed too high, it might not be submerged all the time. And if it is placed too close to the bed, the velocity might be too much influenced by the bed. ADCP can also be used from a boat 
to measure vertical profiles below the path of the boat that is crossing the river. By selecting only the velocity components normal to the flow direction, errors due to the irregular path of the boat can be avoided. With this technique, a detailed picture of the velocity distribution over the cross-section can be obtained, resulting in a more accurate integration. Another method that provides a direct measurement of the discharge is the dilution of a tracer. A given mass of tracer with a known concentration is injected at the injection point, and the concentration is measured further downstream at the measurement section, located far enough to ensure a more or less constant distribution of the tracer by mixing, but not too far to avoid loss of tracer by dilution. Measuring the time it takes for the whole tracer to pass through the measurement section allows to deduce the discharge with the equations indicated here. The typical indirect measurement is the measurement of the water level to deduce the discharge through a rating curve. Such a curve is constructed from several water level measurements and corresponding discharge measurements at a given station. These discharge measurements are achieved, for example, by point measurement and integration of the velocity, but it is done only a limited number of times. And then, from these measure points, a stage discharge relation, like here, can be constructed. And from there, the discharge can be deduced from a water level measurement only. So here, if we measure this depth, we can deduce the corresponding discharge. Of course, this works well only for discharges in the measurement range. In case of severe flood resulting in very high water levels, extrapolation of the stage discharge curve might result in significant errors. Another indirect measurement, also based on a water level measurement, can be achieved using a weir. Often, for small streams, triangular weirs are installed because they provide a more accurate relation than rectangular weirs. Finally, specific devices like venturi or partial flumes can be installed, but again only in small streams. Knowing the flow profile in such a device and through a measurement of the water level at one or two measurement points allows to, allow to obtain an accurate measurement of the discharge. Such a device will be discussed more in details in a further lesson, when we will discuss water profiles in complex geometries. So this finishes this lesson and see you for the next one.